Welcome to Tokyo Wave, recorded in a live studio in Harajuku, Japan, with your hosts, Aaron and Parker. All right, everyone, welcome to episode 94 of Tokyo Wave. We are your hosts, Aaron Randall and Parker Allen. Today we are joined by a special guest, Reuters correspondent Rocky Swift. On Tokyo Wave, we bring you weekly updates from our studio in Harajuku. Join us in segments featuring this week's top news, political happenings, business, and other random stuff. To get us started, here are this week's top news highlights. Japan to see higher prices for food and daily goods from April. SMBC Nikko Securities Vice President Arrested on Stock Market Manipulation Charge 24 officers in Japan referred to prosecutors for alleged card gambling at Police Storm This Week in Japan Alright, let's get started. Japan to see higher prices for food and daily goods from April Kyoto News has reported that the Japanese consumers are expected to face more challenges amid the ongoing coronavirus pandemic as a wave of price hikes will hit essential items such as food and daily goods in the new fiscal year beginning April 1st due to the rising cost of raw materials. Since there will be changes in fiscal 2022 in some social systems closely related to people's day-to-day -day living, such as the lowering of the amount of public pension benefits, the rising prices are likely to squeeze socially vulnerable people like pensioners particularly hard. For example, Meg Milk Snow Brand Meiji and Morinaga Milk will raise their prices for cheese, while the Nishin Oilio Group and J Oil Mills Inc. said they will increase their prices of cooking oil for household use. Other food items subject to the upcoming price hikes include Kagome's tomato ketchup and Yaokin's umaibo, a popular snack meaning delicious stick that has been sold at 10 yen without tax for more than 40 years. That's less than 10 cents. The new price of umaibo is set at 12 yen, according to the snack maker based in Tokyo. And you know, this is all happening at the same time while the uh, yen is at a historic low, especially compared to the US dollar. Um, very frustrating. Very frustrating indeed. What is going to happen to these Japanese consumers and what's going to happen to us as Japanese consumers? <laughs> What did they do the last time in 2011? Like they did something to like bring the yen back up, but I forgot what it was. Magic. I think they used magic. They need to use that again. Yes. And up next, SMBC Nikko Securities Vice President arrested on stock market manipulation charge. The Mainichi has reported that the Tokyo District Public Prosecutor's Office arrested SMBC Nikko Securities Inc. Vice President Toshihiro Sato on March 24th on suspicion of stock market manipulation. Sato, 59 years old, stands accused of violating the Financial Instruments and Exchange Act by manipulating the stock market to prevent the decline of specific stock in April 2021. He is the fifth executive from the securities firm to be arrested. The Special Investigation Unit of the Tokyo District Public Prosecutor's Office suspects that the major securities firm systematically manipulated the stock market and is working to uncover the full details. Whoa, this is a big one. Yeah, 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 damn. Surprised they have the uh, infrastructure to do such things, but I guess if you're that big, you can do it. Yeah, too big to fail. Yeah. Too big to not manipulate? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, if we know anything about the public prosecutor's office, these executives are probably not having a very fun time right now. Definitely. And they're either apologizing or being yelled at a lot by the prosecutors. Sucks to be them. All right, and up next, 24 officers in Japan referred to prosecutors for alleged card gambling at police storm. The Mainichi has also reported that 24 Chiba Prefectural Police officers were referred to prosecutors on March 30th for allegedly gambling on card games at a police training academy dorm. The Prefectural Police sent papers on the officers, all men aged between 20 and 23, to prosecutors on suspicion of illegal gambling, 
and is considering taking punitive action. There were apparently games in which several hundred thousand yen, which is about several thousand dollars, were at stake. The 24 patrol officers had been re enrolled in the prefectural police school in the city of Togane for supplementary courses after finishing basic training there and being assigned to their first police stations. They were learning basics such as how to write investigation reports and living in the dorm at the time of the alleged gambling. They stand accused of betting 100 yen, that's about 80 cents USD, to 50,000 yen, that's about $410. When playing card games such as Blackjack and the Japanese game Dai Fugo multiple times at the dorm in September 2021. The officers have reportedly admitted to the allegations against them, with one quoted as saying, Well, at first we were just betting non alcoholic drinks, but we began to enjoy the thrill of betting cash. We knew gambling was illegal, but it's awesome. Come on, guys, we're cops. We're above the law. God damn it. I think this is a uh, uh, what this, this isn't the first time we've reported on uh, cops doing uh, gambling activity, right? Yeah, they seem to uh, like doing illegal things. Yeah, maybe for they sure. should have picked a different profession, like you know, working for the Ministry of Finance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, and up next we have a special interview with Rocky Swift, a Reuters correspondent based here in Tokyo, Japan. You're now listening to Tokyo Wave. Originally from Florida in the United States, Rocky Swift is a graduate of the New School of Florida and obtained his MBA from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Rocky has extensive experience as a journalist with over a decade of experience reporting for the Charlotte Sun-Herald, Standard & Poor's, Bloomberg, and Reuters. In between his journalism career... Rocky spent five years as a U.S. Foreign Service officer, working as a diplomat for the U.S. Department of State, serving in the Caribbean, Washington, D.C., Nigeria, and Japan. Now, as a Tokyo-based correspondent for Thomson Reuters, Rocky reports on diverse beats, including public health, economics, luxury goods, and currency markets. Rocky is an active member of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan Speakers Committee. Rocky, thank you so much for joining us on Tokyo Wave today. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. All right, let's get started. So you said before we started that you went to the new college in Sarasota, Florida, which was actually founded by the circus magnates, the Ringling Brothers. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, it's a little bit different than that. So it was founded by some other founders in the area, but it's housed. A lot of the buildings are in these these old, like, uh, Rococo mansions built by the circus magnates it was john ringling and and uh and uh mabel ringling and and so they it was the winter home of the wing of the ringling circus because they had to you know go somewhere where it was warm for the elephants and the lions and the tigers and whatever so they you know this is back when everybody traveled by train so this the circus would take a train down to sarasota and they'd rest there and then they're actually like there are houses that were made for little people. And so in, in, the, in the neighborhoods where uh, my sister lives, you can see these houses and they're built and they're like two or three stories, but they were built for, for little people that you know worked in the circus, for example. And so most of Sarasota is named either Ringling This, Ringling That. There's a Ringling College of Art and Design that was actually <laughs> founded by the Ringling family. And then my school, New College, uh, it's just housed on a lot of their old, you know, rich guy circus houses and stuff. If I was a circus rich guy, I'd probably make some pretty wild mansions, too. And there's like an art museum there, too. So the John and Mabel Ringling uh, School, um, you know, Museum of Art. And basically, you know, he was a very, very wealthy man for the time. We're talking like the 20s and 30s. And he would just go to Europe and say, buy this, buy that, buy this, buy that. And he didn't have the greatest taste. You know, he mostly was into the Rubenesque type art. So there's lots of uh, lots of that. But everything that was purchased by the museum after, you know, he passed on is generally of a little bit better quality from an art perspective. That's interesting. You seem to be really in on the art scene. Do you have uh, some interest in art? Just to, as an amateur, you know, that was my early education is because, 
being a student, I was able to go into the museum for free. And so if I was just bored, I'd just walk around and see, you know, there's an El Greco and, you know, here's a Renoir and here's a, you know, some Manets, whatever. And then, you know, wherever I lived in the world, I loved uh, going to museums. I, I lived in New York for a bit. My favorite museum there is the Frick, the Frick Gallery. I don't know if you've been there. Everyone goes to the Met. The Met is, is wonderful, but it's overrun. And you can't see it in, unless you have like days or a week. But the frick you can get done in a couple hours. And it's beautiful. It's sedate. It's in another old rich guy's house. So Those old rich guys, they have the just best houses to have art collections. They got to do then. something with their money. Their, their ill-begotten gains from their golden age excess. I can just imagine the, the founders of the Ring-a-Ling Circus going to Paris and being like, well, uh, let's get uh, 10 of those and uh, five of those. And uh, you ain't got any paintings of elephants? You know, I love elephants. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there, there was this giant uh, building when I was in school there. It was called the Ringling Towers. And it was like, and it's, it's gone. They raised it and they put up like, a, I think like a Four Seasons or something. But I remember, like, I had an in- internship with a TV station. It was the ABC affiliate there. And at that time, it was like, save the Ringling Towers. And they were trying to raise some money to save it. So I went in there with, like, a TV crew. And they were, they were giving, like, a, uh, a tour. And it was like, and this would have been the grand ballroom. And then let me draw your attention to this iron ring in the floor. And this is where the Ringlings would hook up a baby elephant to entertain their guests. And it was just like, <laughs> it's so grim. <laughs> You're in this dilapidated building that's just full of graffiti and it's you know falling apart. And here is this literal symbol of animal slavery. <laughs> like that's still extant. And of course it's raised and you know, probably good riddance. Wow. Sounds like it could have been converted into a haunted house rather easily. Most definitely. I, I don't notice an iron ring in your, in your floor here, Parker, so I, I can tell you don't have the class of a I'm golden not, age I, circus I man. haven't gotten to baby elephant money yet. <laughs> yeah, one day. <laughs> one Dreams. Day. I can dream, can't I? So, uh, Rocky, one thing we ask all of our guests is, what brought you to Japan? Could you tell us a bit about your Japan story? Sure. I, I'm, a, I'm an ex-jet, like so many. Uh, foreigners. I, I remember in college, a friend of mine had told these stories about going to Europe and teaching English in the Czech Republic back at that time. And he had these awesome stories. And I had never been anywhere, you know, in my life. You know, I didn't have a passport. You know, I'd never been anywhere but basically Florida and Georgia. And I thought, that sounds so cool. You know, and it seems like a good way to see the world. But I didn't necessarily want to go to the Czech Republic. So I started like looking around and I looked into Jet, and I was like, yeah, that sounds like a good one to do. So it sort of stayed in the back of my mind, and I, I graduated, and I went on and, you know, had a, my first newspaper job. But then, you know, while I was there in Florida, working as a reporter in, in uh, southwest Florida, you know, I applied, and I got in. And then next thing you know, I'm down at the uh, the embassy. Well, you, you apply at the embassy down in Miami, and then mm. a few months after that, you get in, and... And then I'm on a plane out, out to Japan for the first time. It sounds like you got a passport to go to Japan. Well, you know, now that, now that I recall, I did have a passport before that. I guess, yeah, because I, I, and I forget, forgive me, you know, I'm middle-aged now. But I had been to uh, England for a bit. I had kind of taken a semester off and I worked in, in a pub in <laughs> North London for oh, a bit. Because cool. so many of my friends were doing these, you know, exchange programs or whatever. But I was broke and I couldn't, I couldn't afford to not work or not be in school. So I just dropped out of school. I took a leave of absence. And I got one of these, like, you know, temporary work permits. And I'm just in London. And in daytime, I'm, I'm typing. I was a pretty good typer. And that time you could get a job just by typing. And then, uh, and then I, the night I was pulling beers in a pub. And then so that was my actual first uh, overseas experience, why I got the, the passport. But then the second one, yeah, was getting on a plane and coming to Japan. Wow. So for our listeners not familiar with the JET program, could you explain what it is? It's a Japan exchange and teaching program that was founded in uh, the late 80s. And this was kind of in response to... Um, a, a, a trade dispute 
between Japan and the United States. And, and so basically Ronald Reagan wanted Japan to import more cars. And Japan was like, no, we don't want your cars, but maybe we'll just give a bunch of your young people cushy jobs. <laughs> and they, and, uh, and that's kind of how it came about. There was a, a good book on this called Importing Diversity. Um, I read it a long time ago. Um, and I interviewed the author at the time for our Jet magazine. And what you could say is Jet started in the late 80s. It's still going. At one time, maybe still, it's the biggest internationalization project in the world. And so ostensibly, these young people come to Japan to teach English at, um, at the public schools from elementary to high school. Um, but in fact, it's never been truly, you know, embraced, I should say, by Monbosho, by the educational system. So it's, I would say the JET program has been a big success, but mostly as an inter internationalization project, as a PR project for Japan. Because mm. you bring in people like, like me and so many people at Reuters and at the State Department that come, have a good time, learn Japanese, and get a, a, an affinity for the country, and they you come know, back. And you know, it's funny. It's like I feel like this this huge swath of foreign nationals living in Japan and working in Japan and long long termers, lifers, you call them. Uh, they're either Jets or Mormons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, that seems to be like the main. Paths. I mean, I, I went to grad school. One of my best friends from grad school was a Mormon missionary, and he was out selling God uh, in, in Hiroshima. Last week, I interviewed a guy who's a very successful investor who came as a Mormon missionary in Hokkaido. And so many of like the bankers and investors and such, you know, have that sort of that Mormon background where they, they came over, they learned the language, they learned the culture, they loved the culture. And then they went back to school with their MBAs and their finance degrees. And then they were kind of like the Marine Corps of capitalism because they come and they establish a beachhead, you know, they set up the company and then they become the executives of the company. So I'm not nearly as successful as those <laughs> as those missionaries but but yeah if you're there's a lot of jets for sure definitely definitely it reminds me uh, one of my good friends is actually a former mormon missionary who went off the reservation mm. and actually became a gaijin host uh <laughs> serving alcoholic beverages to uh japanese ladies and my, my first uh kind of boss in japan i was kind of finishing up my mba and i was an intern at a hedge fund and he was another one of these mormon missionaries who you know, came and set up shop and did quite well until the financial crisis and then did other things. So, right, yeah. right. So, of course, the JET program is uh, like a lot of things. It's a lottery, right? You sign up for the JET program. You don't know where you're going to go. Where did you end up and how was that? Yeah, it was a total, um, you know, it, it was, yeah, as you say, it was total chance. I ended up in southern Nagano in this town called Komagane. And, uh, as luck would have it, it's still like one of the most beautiful places I've ever been, let alone lived. Uh, it's nestled between the Chuo and Minami Alps. It's off the Chuo Expressway. It's it's kind of famous if you've ever heard of Yomeishu, which is kind of like a alcoholic Genki drink. It's made in, in Komagane. Uh, the uh, Jaika, the, the Japanese version of the Peace Corps, basically, has a training center there um, because it's it's you know, there's beautiful mountains, there's forests, rice fields, you know, it's got, a, it's a little bit urban and that, you know, like I was telling you before, they've got a McDonald's and Komagane, but they got big a, deal. Yeah. They got, <laughs> if you're jonesing for the American taste, you can get it, but yeah, I love it. And it, I still go back, you know, try to go back once a year or so just to sort of soak it back in. That's awesome. Well, it's, it's kind of like a, not a resort town per se, but sort of like a semi resort town where like places like Jaika will have training centers and I'm sure it has a great natural beauty. Oh yeah. Hot springs and stuff. You know, it's, it's, it is a minor tourist destination, I would say for, you know, you know, Japanese populace mostly, but not a lot of foreigners would get out there unless they know something like me, like I do, but <laughs> I didn't know a thing or two, but a thing or two. Yeah. Tokyo wave top tick. Check out Miami Shinano in Nagano. It is off the beaten path. And as Rocky says, it is lit. Another product you might know Mars whiskey is made there. No. Oh, shit. Wow. Yeah. 
So it's uh, the, the famous mountain is all called Komagatake. And then Komagane, if you, if you can imagine the kanji, it's like the, the foot or the root of the mountain. So yeah, like it's, it's, I think it's called the Mount Komagatake, you know, distillery or something like that. Mars was never my favorite of the Japanese whiskeys, but... It's kind of like uh, the sort of thing that's at the bottom shelf at 7-Eleven, you know? Mm-hmm. But I mean, like every, every Japanese whiskey is kind of riding this boom or, or did, you know, a few years ago until the supplies ran out. So I don't want, I don't want to dog out Mars, but you know, it, it, it's, it couldn't be in a more beautiful place. I could say that a beautiful place with some great local hooch. Go check it out. <laughs> so after jet, you joined Bloomberg while well, after some other experiences and you got into reporting stocks and bonds. What was that like? Well, yeah, like, so I, I always had an interest in journalism. Um, my school was so small, didn't have a journalism program. So I studied economics, but I worked on the school paper. I did like some stringing for uh, St. Pete Times and some other papers. So then I, I got a job pretty, pretty soon out of, out of college. And then, um, so then I went to, did JET, went to grad school. But really at the, at the end of the day, like it, it all just set me up to be just a better reporter. You know, I thought maybe I'll be a hedge fund guy or an analyst guy, but you know, I just had to kind of come to Jesus moment where I realized like I could be a bad analyst or maybe a slightly better writer about the markets and such. So uh, I got into uh, Bloomberg and that was kind of getting me back into journalism. And yeah, I covered the stock market uh, as an editor, as a reporter, eventually went into um, running a team that was covering uh, bonds and currencies. And so you were talking about currencies earlier. I mean, like, yeah, the, the, I was around in 2011 when the, uh, you know, the big earthquake came and the, the yen suddenly strengthened. So I remember I was at my desk at my Bloomberg terminal and the building is still shaking. And, and the Sheen Motor Building is a big building in the middle yeah, of modern, it's a modern Machine, building, yeah. but not the Sheen. But, but so it was really funny to see because the currency markets are kind of like the pulse of, of a national economy. You can see it, you know, moving in real time. So I'm watching, and so the dollar yen rate is a graph that as it as the yen weakens, it goes up, right? Because it's more yen to the dollar when it strengthens it goes down so right now we're going in, we're in a really weak yen environment it's like the weakest in five or six years but on a trade weighted basis it's like the weakest in like 40 or 50. wow yeah, yeah. i didn't think about that yeah that, that's when they say that the yen is so weak that's really what they're talking about because you know in my life in my you know 20 years off and on in japan it's been way weaker than this on a on a on a nominal basis. It's been as weak as like 136, I think, to the dollar. But it's a trade-weighted basis that makes it so weak right now. But here's my anecdote about 2011. So I'm at my desk, and you see the yen, and it's going straight up, so it's weakening. Because this is what usually happens when there's a disaster. Like the company, like that country's stocks and bonds and currency go down because, you know, it's bad for the economy. But you could kind of see the traders realize well, what was going to happen in real time. So initially it weakened and then it started driving into the dirt, which meant it was strengthening. Because what was happening, the, the traders were saying, OK, there's a big quake. It's the biggest in memory. What's, when was the last big quake? 1995. Kobe. What happened in, in 1995? The end weakened. I'm sorry, the end strengthened. It hit a record high versus the dollar. Why did it do that? Because everyone then speculated, Japan is going to have so much damage, it's going to have to sell its stuff overseas and bring those assets home, right? So then it's like the traders realized in real time, oh yeah, this is going to be 95 all over again. The end is going to strengthen. We have to get ahead of this. So the end strengthened to a new record high in 2011, and, and usually a, a strong yen is bad for the Japanese economy because it's so uh, impacted by, am I talking too long? Is this no, interesting? <laughs> this is great. Please, please continue. So, so usually the, the, the weak, uh, a weak yen is good for the economy. A strong yen is bad for the economy. So as the yen was going to a record, which I think it, the record ended up being 72 or so 
72 versus the dollar. I remember that. Yeah. It was a bad time to be a uh, parent funded college student. <laughs> and I was paid in yen. And this actually put me in a different tax bracket. <laughs> I had suddenly Uncle Sam is like, you made a lot more money last year. I was like, no, I didn't. It's just my my dollar uh, converted salary went yes, up by you thir- did, 30, 40 percent. So then the, you know, the Ministry of Finance started to intervene to make the end weaker. And they did this over and over and over until they started nudging it back up to its sort of natural rate of around 90 to 100 and that's where it was for like a long time. And so now we're seeing the opposite problem, that the yen is weakening a lot and weakening in a way that is making uh, businesses and consumers a little uncomfortable. And so there is speculation that the government will intervene again to weaken the yen. Sorry, wait, what did I say? Strengthen the yen, to strengthen. And they haven't done that in a long time, not in memory. They've al- almost always, when they intervene, they intervene to, to weaken the yen to help exporters. I've heard that, you know, as soon as it gets down to 70, I think it is, um, that's when they expect, if the government's going to come in, that's when, when they're going to come in. Well, so right now it's, it, it hit 125, 126 a, a, a day or two ago. The yen strengthened back to around 120, 121. And so for most of like, to, to give example for that, for most of the last 10 years, it's been around 115. Right, right. So 110, 115. A natural rate, you know, historical rate of the last, you know, 40, 50 years is like, not, no, that's not right. 20 years is like 105. 105 is like a comfortable whew, hold, sort of like, you know, in the onsen, like, you know, that's, that's like the sweet spot. Anything that's like 120, 130, the Japanese economy has changed and such that having a weak currency isn't this great thing that it used to be. And that, that's a complicated answer about why that is, but that's the reality. Well, that's a really good point. And I think that Japanese firms essentially create strategies for doing business based on certain exchange rates. And once that sort of logic stops working, their business strategy stops working. And so what are they going to do? I mean, obviously, each company has to react in its own way, but uh, this is uh, an interesting time for Japan, and these rising prices that we just talked about uh, earlier in our news segment are really going to start hitting the wallets of Japanese consumers, and people are going to start wondering what the government is going to do to protect people from these rising prices. You know, that's certainly going to be an election issue. Um, for Kishida and the government. And so this week they've, you know, they've ruled out like some new plans to help people cope with not just because even for the end was weakening. There were also inflationary pressures that were partly due to COVID and, and then that got worse with the Ukraine crisis. Because again, Japan is dependent on imports for a lot of things. Most of its energy, a lot of its food, um, sorts of things. So, and, and companies have been used to, as you said, coping with this over time by, you know, complicated financial hedging, you know, with currencies, but also by internationalization. So like a company like Uniqlo or fast retailing, for example, you know, probably gets, you know, more, I don't know the exact numbers right now, but it, it's so global that it's not really it's it's fortunes are not really that dependent on a either strong or weak yen for example uh, that's what their cfo said like last october when he was asked about this their earnings is coming up in in a couple weeks i'm sure that'll be another topic but yeah it's 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 not as simple as it used to be for for countries like korea especially korea but also japan taiwan china these are countries that typically wanted a weak currency because they were selling stuff overseas that made their products more competitive. But now it's, it's just, it's not that simple. That's interesting how the globalization of Japan Inc. has totally changed the paradigm for currency expectations. And it's going to affect markets, it's going to affect consumer behavior, and who in the hell knows what's going to happen next? 
kind of hard to say. Uh, you talked about Prime Minister Kishida for a second, and because I am a Japan politics nerd from hell, uh, I wanted to ask, obviously, Kishida assumed office in October of last year. He's coming up on six months in the saddle. What is your impression of his leadership thus far, and do you think he will last? Obviously, the big question is, is he going to be another long-termer like Prime Minister Abe, or is he going to be another one-year wonder like Suga and many, many prime ministers before him? Well, I don't... Um, I'm on dangerous ground here because I'm not a political <laughs> correspondent. This is not a, a measure of expertise for me, but what I can say is, I mean, Kishida came... I, I can just say the facts. Kishida came in prioritizing uh, the COVID fight, the COVID response. Uh, because there was a lot of dissatisfaction uh, with some aspects of the Suga administration for that. So, uh, you know, Kishida, as a, you know, it seems like a very different sort of LDP kind of politician. You, you know, when you, when you hear his new capitalism and um, sort of rhetoric and the plans for leveling the playing field for, you know, really, really uh, putting the, putting a lot of pressure on companies to raise wages. You know, it's it sounds, you know, quasi-socialistic, right? Kind of funny because the LDP is, you know, last time I checked a conservative party. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing is, if you're from an American perspective and if you're just a very simplified thing, you're like, okay, LDP is the Republicans and, and the DPJ, which is no DPG, 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 DPG. They, you know, they don't really exist anymore. They were the Democrats. This is This is how we used to think about it. But, you know, that has obviously changed quite a lot. And LDP is back in control. And there's, a, there's clearly a very wide spectrum of politicians within the LDP. So, again, I guess uh, what I should go back to is what I specialize in, COVID. He came in pledging to, um, you know, focus on COVID. And, you know, I, th I think that still is, is going to be a, a strong uh, focus going forward. You know, they, he has been... Uh, you know, some would say, um, especially amongst the foreigner community, that he kept the borders closed too long. But again, he came in under a pr campaign promise of protecting the populace, and it was it was a popular policy amongst the, the vote the people that actually vote in this country, and I, I'm not one of them. They they were they supported the closed borders, and they supported um, by and large his, the way he's. Um, prosecuted the COVID strategy. You know, it's really interesting to look at that COVID policy and how it works vis-a-vis -vis the entry of foreigners into Japan. Uh, until March, uh, it was impossible for new visa holders to enter Japan. And now from March 1st, there is a system by which people can get into Japan. We've explained it on earlier episodes. It is very uh, and it's still I mean if you want to come into Japan on a business trip you've got a mountain of paperwork that you have to do and it is insane how the government has really run circles around you know trying to keep the borders basically as shut as possible while still making some small modicum of, well, if you really, 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 really want to come, you can come to Japan. All right. But if you're a tourist, sorry. Yeah, yeah it's, it's been tough. I mean, it's been, it all, for all intents and purposes, closed for two years. And it's creeping open. We've done it. We did it at Reuters a number of stories on this. Almost all media did. But, you know, the ones that I worked on, I, mean, I talked to a lot of students who were stranded overseas who were you know, trying to do uh, online classes at 3 a.m. in Italy or Korea, you know, just to sort of try to stay in their program in Japan when they, they may have gotten a, a scholarship or they still had a dream of coming here eventually. And a lot of them just gave, just gave up, mm. you know, and went somewhere else, you know, Korea or, you know, or the U.S. And so, you know, I think however popular that border strategy may have been with the domestic voters you know the the knock-on effect on japan's soft power may um, 
may manifest for years to come. That's right. And, you know, honestly, I think people will still come to Japan once it's open again. I think it won't hurt tourism that much. What I am really worried about, it's not my first time saying it, I'm afraid it's not going to be the last, is I do think there's going to be a dearth of Japan hands. And it's going to be a direct result of this policy, which more or less has been around for the better part of two years. Yeah. I mean, for example, I talked with a with a renowned, world-renowned scientist, in, and he's an Italian guy, and he works at uh, Riken um, in Yokohama. And he's like, you know, not every country has the same pool of talent. And he's like, I need these, I'm not even going to say it right, bioinformaticists. And these you are... said it right. <laughs> these are people that, you know, are critical for genetic research. And he's like, I don't... Japan alone does not have... Uh, the, the pool of talent that we need to do our, you know, groundbreaking research. And that's no knock on Japan. No country has the whole spectrum of talent. So he's like, I haven't been able to bring in any foreign, you know, scientists in two years. My, my lab is suffering. Our work is suffering. And what that means is, and Riken is like Japan's, you know, most renowned scientific, you know, institution. That means Japan is falling behind. So it, it is a matter of national pride, national security, economic security, um, that you won't see it tomorrow, you won't see it next week, but you might see it in the years to come. There's uh, about thirty to 40,000 uh, software development jobs that are needed right now in Japan and can't be filled because... Um, uh, the trend for the past 10 years for most big tech companies or even like companies like Rakuten is a lot of the core software dev teams are all non-Japanese. They're from India, the U.S., you know, South Korea. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and they're not getting in. So, Rocky, after your journalism experience, you joined the U.S. Department of State and became a diplomat. Uh, what was it like working around the world for Uncle Sam? Well, that was another dream of mine. You know, I had a dream to be a foreign correspondent and a dream to be a diplomat. And so it was a, it was an honor to be able to, to do that as well. And, uh, you know, I have to say it's the, it was my first time, you know, I, I joined in my late thirties and it was great. Um, but again, it was probably my first time working in a giant government bureaucracy. <laughs> so that, that was a kind of a tough adjustment, but I mean, it was an, a, an amazing opportunity and I made some incredible friends, I traveled a lot, you know, and it's it, it, embassies or consulates. They're like little pockets of America. And for, for example, like one of the countries I worked in was, was in uh, Nigeria and I was in Abuja, which is the capital. A lot of people think of Lagos as, as that's the Nigerian city they think of. And it used to be the capital, but they moved it to more uh, the middle of the country um, to be more democratic, I guess. So Abuja is the actual capital. But like, you know, in this community, you know, you wouldn't be able to find certain things like, you know, if you wanted sour cream or kimchi or, you know, fresh pasta. So you have this community of people like that. You know, oh, so and so learned how to make kimchi. <laughs> so you're, it's we call it one, one of my friends, we called it like, um, like, uh, little embassy on the prairie and that you're sort of, you know, and, and like, for example, I, on, I was shown cause there's a huge, uh, I'm not, I don't know if it's huge, but there's a pretty big, uh, China component in Nigeria and pretty much all of Africa. Um, uh, Chinese workers that are building their airports, building their roads and their mining and such. But there was like a secret Chinese supermarket that was like behind literally like an iron gate wall and you would never know it's there. And I, it was shown to me. They and, built and, a great wall around a supermarket. <laughs> and there was no sign, nothing. You just had to know where it was. And you drove up, you honked your horn. And then somebody would pull the gate open and you, and there was like a, a Chinese market and the, you know, they welcomed anybody, but it's like, if you wanted tofu, that's the only place you could get it. If you wanted like oyster sauce or, you know, any kind of like treats for a stir fry or something. So little things like that were like, kind of like, it, it was a challenge, but it was also fun. And there, there's versions of that in, in every 
uh, embassy and consulate around the world. That's amazing. Well, I mean, I've been friends with you, Rocky, since um, when I was in college. So I guess about, what, 13-ish years now. And I think you were at Bloomberg at the time. Yeah, it was, probably was. And thinking about that, you know, I remember meeting you. It's like int- being introduced to Rocky Swift, the guy with the coolest name in the universe. But then when you joined the U.S. Department of State, you had to change to your government name, which yeah. is... James. Yeah, Swift. my real name is James Harold Swift. Yeah, in you know, when I had to make my Meishi, you know, for you know, going to diplomatic events or something, or it just it was it was too hard to explain Rocky. It just didn't sound like a proper diplomatic name. Right. <laughs> so right. I, I went by but you know, most all my friends still call me Rocky and such. So Yes, and now you're back to full force Rocky Swift and now I have to ask you the question I've been wanting to ask you for 13 years okay how did you get the name Rocky the short the short answer is my father's name is James as well so you know we're we're both James Swift so I guess as a baby as a toddler it was just a dumb nickname they gave me to sort of separate me from my dad and my mom used to say it's because I like the rocking horse or, but my dad said, nah, your mom had a crush on Sylvester Stallone or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I grew up thinking that my name was Rocky. And then comes like the, the uh, fateful day that I'm starting kindergarten. And my mom drives me up and she says, oh, by the way, um, the teacher is, uh, she's probably going to call you James. And I said, why? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, <laughs> That's your name. And I, I, kinda, I knew it was one of my names, but I was like, but, but what about Rocky? It's just, that's just a nickname we gave you. And I started crying because my little five-year-old identity was just being shattered oh, you wow. know, in front of me. And my mom, like, like, like a young parent, is like, uh, stop crying. We'll, we'll talk to the teacher. Maybe you can just, just be Rocky. And you know, there we go. So did your kindergarten teacher call you Rocky? Yep. Yeah, I was Rocky all through my... My life, you know, and of course, as a kid, you know, you get teased a lot. Hey, Rocky. And like, you know, I've heard all of like the Rocky Balboa jokes, all the Rocky Bullwinkle jokes. And they're all hurtful in their own ways. But the best, the best, because I had to give him credit for originality, was of this cruel PE teacher who said, uh, you know, we're doing wind sprints or something. I don't know. He's like, all right, hurry up there, rock strap. And I was like, and everybody just busted out laughing at me. And it was, it was like, oh, it was like a knife in the heart because it was so clever and so hurtful. <laughs> and it immediately became a new nickname, like, hey, Rockstrap, Rockstrap. But I had to give him credit, you know, he, he came up with something fresh that- to crush my poor little teenage ego into an even smaller spec. So thank you. Cater Pierce, my uh, PE teacher from uh, middle Georgia. He really had a way with young men in the nineties. <laughs> was that how uh, Leonard Skinner got their name is they had this, uh, like it was it wasn't a PE teacher, but this like asshole teacher whose name was Leonard Skinner and they just hated him and he was an asshole. And so they named their band after him. Could be. I mean, it's at times I've thought about getting rid of it because for one reason or another, but I don't know. I just, I'm just Rocky. And another way that it was helpful to have a real name and a kind of fake name was while I was at Bloomberg, I had actually just joined and I had this kind of fascination with North Korea and I had looked into ways to get into North Korea. It was like 2007, 2008 or so. And North Korea does allow some tour. Well, it did. I don't know about it anymore. Uh, but at that time, they, they actually wanted tourists in because it was the easiest way for them to get hard currency. At that time, North Korea was really into euros. So uh, I wanted to get into North Korea, and there was an application process. And so I did not tell a lie. I said, my name is James Swift, and I work at Bloomberg LP, and I file financial reports. But nothing I've ever written as a journalist has been under the name James Swift. So I got in and I told my boss at the time, I was like, I think I can get in North Korea. And he's like, okay. 
I was like, if I go to North Korea, can I write a story about it? He said, sure. And I says, and uh, will you pay for it? He said, nope. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and uh, and that boss is still a good friend of mine. He's, he's, he sees up the press club. So yeah, I did. I, I, I got in North Korea for three days and, and I came back. I wrote just a dumb kind of travel log about it. The, the same kind of story that everybody writes about North Korea because they really control your, your movements. But yeah, they didn't. It, it, if, if they cottoned on to the fact that I was a journalist and my name really was Rocky Swift, then they, they didn't bust me for it. And I'm, I'm not in a prison camp. So... <laughs> There, there was a period of yeah, about... At least your name wasn't Warm Beer. Apparently, Oof. that'll really... Uh... I mean, that's... But, you know, that that was a chilling time. I remember that story coming out. I was like... Because when I was there, you know... It, you know, people are drinking and having a good time, going to karaoke and stuff in North Korea. I'm like, you know, I could have been one, sm you know, small step from being in the same situation. Because that guy, what did he do? He just stole like a poster... And then they, they threw him in jail. Uh, and they the guy died. Who, he warm was beer. Otto Warm Beer. Yeah, he stole a propaganda poster. Yes. Was, I think it was like a, like maybe there was like a bet involved or. One of his like neighbors or someone from his church. Give me like, a poster from that North Korea. Right, I really right. want one for my poster collection. Or Is he still locked up? He's, He's dead. dead. Oh my God! They they repatriated him and he was in a coma. That's right. And they, oh man. So then you know it's a. The family said he was tortured. The North Korea said that, you know, he got sick and they gave him like an antidepressant or something and they had a bad reaction. Uh, so I don't know. But he he came back nearly dead and he died shortly after. Yikes. Yeah. Wow. That took a dark turn. <laughs> well, uh, getting back into less macabre topic. Did I say that right? Macabre? Mac macabre. Get it. I had a one-armed uh, uh, history teacher in high school with no fewer than three speech impediments. And uh, he was a football coach and he was not really a good teacher. But he, mis he mispronounced all types of things. And I remember like one time he's, he's reading out of a textbook and, and, uh, and, and, and then they had the Boston Massacre. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and he, it was called a Charlie Jeanette, Jeanette. and he, he had a, a lisp, and I, I don't mean this to make fun of people with speech impediments. I'm just telling a historical f anecdote. From, there was a real story. And then he, we, he, he got to um, U U.S. history, modern, relative, and he talked about uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt, his favorite saying was, speak softly and carry a big dick. And everyone wow. in the class is like, <laughs> <laughs> is exploding probably. Wow. Be dofty and carry a big. Anyway, so we all. Wow. Are. So, yep, football coaches in Georgia don't make the best history teachers. When you say one armed, he he had one arm. He had, you know, he was an old guy, and back, you know, when he was a kid, you know, he had like a farming accident, and in those days, it just chop it off. <laughs> Wow. But, but apparently he was a good athlete. He played baseball. He played football. And then uh, he was a football coach. Rocky, I'd love to ask you a question about your time uh, as a U.S. Foreign Service officer. So being a fellow Floridian, I have been to the Caribbean, but you actually worked there for the, the, go for the government. I think most Floridians think, oh, the Caribbean, that's where the cruise ships stop. And, you know, you get out and have a couple shots of whiskey and you get back on the cruise ship. What was it like actually living down there? Uh, you know, I was in the Trinidad and Tobago, Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, so that's cool. where they filmed that Jay-Z big pimpin' video. I don't know. See, that, that's another thing that people, when they think about Caribbean, yeah, 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 that's yeah, where yeah, the, yeah. the pimpin' video was. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it was a beautiful place, but you know, it's not a typical destination. Um, because it is in the, in, in the Caribbean, but it's actually an energy powerhouse. They have a lot of uh, LNG. Because it, you, if you think about it, it's like 90 miles from Venezuela as the you know crow flies. So it, it sort of feeds. Venezuela's got some uh, a decent. A uh... lot, lot of energy. So it was kind of a, it was an energy powerhouse. So, I mean, uh, you know, food is good. Culture is, you know, 
fun. Do you used to do like there's like the carnival thing? Yeah, they have versions of that there. And so that that's what they showed in the video, and so it looked really fun because you know Jay Z and UGK and yeah, they looked like they were having a really good time. It is interesting how Caribbean, South Florida, Miami specifically are so influenced and hyper connected to Venezuela, Brazil, you know, a lot of South America. You know, going to South Florida alone, it feels like you're going into a completely different country. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, like, I'm, 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 a, I'm a Florida guy. I mean, I guess. I mean, I, I haven't actually lived in America for more than like a year stretch in... 20 years, oh, you know, wow. maybe, wow. I mean, there was like one year when I was at Bloomberg and, and I, and I transferred to, to New York city and I worked there for about a year. But other than that, yeah, I, I've been, I mean, I guess I was in Hawaii for a year for, for grad school, but I mean, like I haven't been in America for like two years since I was probably in college, you know? Wow. That's interesting thinking about that. And, um, my story is similar. I've spent half my life in Japan, but unlike you, I didn't really go anywhere else. Uh, but looking at your global experience, being able to really see so many different places around the world, obviously you're here in Japan now. Do you feel like this is your permanent home or do you have ideas of, furthering your global experience elsewhere. I th I think I'm going to be here for the foreseeable future. I mean uh, my wife my wife is Japanese, I've been here a long time. Um it's part of the reason I kind of came back. I mean, the state department was uh, you know, an adventure, but you know, at the end of the day it was it's tough on your family and you know, to move around all the time. I I mean that's part of the job, right? But um you know, at the end of the day it's hard to beat the lifestyle in Japan. You know, it's hard to beat the, the, you know, it's a first world country, but it's still interesting. You know, there's still a lot to learn, you know, it's, it's yeah, I dig it. Japan is awesome. Sorry, tourists. We can't come yet. So Rocky, now you're back in journalism working for Reuters, uh, one of the world's largest newswire services. What is your beat and what's the talk of the town right now? Well, um, yeah, when I came back into, you know, settled in Japan f full time again and joined Reuters, Reuters and Bloomberg are pretty similar in terms of what they, they do. And, you know, they, they're both kind of have a financial and economics focus in their newswires. Uh, they both have kind of data products that um, uh, specialize for you know, financial professionals. Um, so I came and they said, uh, why don't you cover pharma? And I was like, well, that's interesting, you know, and, and pharma in Japan is um, the biggest player is, is Takeda, for example, but there's also uh, Daiichi Sankyo is, is a major player, Astellas. Uh, so as I started to get my feet wet back into journalism and Reuters, that's how I kind of focused. It was talking to these companies, talking to biotechs. And then, you know, just a few months in, the uh, COVID crisis hit. And pharma got a lot interesting. Yeah. And, all then, of a sudden. and then it kind of broadened out, you know, it was, it was still those companies, but it was also, you know, how are we going get, to get the vaccines? You know, how is it possible we can make the vaccines here? Do we, you know, how do we get more tests? Are we testing the right numbers of people, numbers of people? So my beat changed in that I was, you know, going to more health ministry meetings. I was talking to more uh, health experts, like the epidemiologists. I mean, that was an interesting thing of this crisis that epidemiologists became rock stars, <laughs> you know? And yeah, they, like Omi Sensei, like where did that guy come from? He's Omi, everywhere now. Omi Sensei, yeah. And I've, I, you know, he, he's, he's kind of like a tag teaming with the prime minister or the economy minister. And he's, and people are really interested because they want to know when they can go back to their regular life or will they be, be protected from this virus or if they get sick will they be able to be treated without getting a serious Ill illness or dying so that became kind of my beat um for reuters and it's been you know kind of a whirlwind um and then other things that have come along like the, you know we did eventually have the olympics right it took a while <laughs> so uh, i did some olympic stuff and uh, i've also been covering uh retail 
Uh, so consumer more broadly, you know, so it could be consumer trends, uh, but it's also like, you know, uh, fast retailing and uh, Muji 7 and I. So and you say, what is the talk of the town? I think it's still it's still COVID. You know, I think, um, inshallah, like if we're not at the end of this pandemic, maybe we're at the beginning of the end. Um, Ooh. Be- because well, well said, I mean, because now we have vaccines and now we have various oral treatments that are proven to work. So hopefully it, you know, the epidemio- epidemiologist would say we've gone, we'll be going from a pandemic to an endemic sort of mm. stage. And the difference is like the flu is endemic. It's always with us, but we manage it. It doesn't stop, uh, you know, commerce and society. So hopefully that's what we'll be kind of transitioning into. Um, the other talk is we already covered a little bit is inflation and, and uh, currency movements. Like these are things that affect people and companies and economies in little and small, in little and big ways and little ways. I mean, I don't know about you guys, if you pay electric bills, you know, everyone's electric bill has gone up a lot for the last few months. It has. Yeah, it's Not doubled, think about tripled. It. I mean, it's, and this is unfortunately probably going to continue, um, you know, as long as, you know, the, especially the Ukraine crisis kind of ripples out in the energy markets. So there were, there were COVID influences on inflation. Uh, everything from, you know, you, you can't get enough port workers so they can't get stuff in ships and the ships you know there's not enough ships to get your mcdonald's fries to japan and there's not enough ships to get your uh your uh kirin or suntory wine from australia these are real examples and so supply and demand there's less supply the demand is still there so the price has to go up so these are the things that were happening before the ukraine crisis and before the end started to weaken so much. So it's, it's quite a lot of influences that are going to impact households, the big companies like Toyota, and then the macro economy. Wow. I feel like you just explained everything very succinctly. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I, I, I can describe it. I can't fix it. I can't prescribe a fix. But it's just sort of like part of it will be, you know, people adapt. They just get used to paying a little bit more for their umaibo, you know. I mean, is 12 cents really that much for a candy, you know? The, the, the thing is that it, it's kind of an irony. I mean, <laughs> somebody called Joe Isuzu. We need to slash the prices. I mean, Japan, the Bank of Japan was has been trying to spur inflation. They wanted, you know, this like, this like a uh, Goldilocks spot of 2% infl- inflation. If only we could do that. And now inflation has come and it's not the, it's not the inflation you want. <laughs> it's not, the, it's not, it's not the good inflation, which helps growth, which encourages investment, which, um, you know, moves capital in a, in a more active way than deflation does. So unfortunately it's the kind of inflation that, that, that comes to you. It's the, the, sort of the cost push inflation rather than demand to pull inflation to use some economic jargon. So it's, it's the bad inflation. And so now we're seeing the government trying to come up with plans to help households deal with it. And then possibly, you know, there's, there's talk they could intervene in currency markets to, um, to address the yen issue, but it's a complicated issue. Wow. I have to go back to the vaccine and the COVID-19 topic because I'm really curious. Obviously, throughout the pandemic, we've gone through these waves of paranoia and not knowing what's going on. However, given your beat, obviously, you were right in front of the forefront of information around the pandemic. Do you think that made you feel more comfortable with what was going on or did it scare the shit out of you? Be honest. (laughs) I mean, I remember being the FCCJ, I think it was February 4th, 2020. And one of the great things about the FCCJ is, you know, we have kind of this platform to bring in experts 
and they, they come. You know, today we had a couple YouTubers from Ukraine, for example, that you know spoke very uh, movingly about the crisis in their homeland. But at that time, it was a Professor uh, uh, Hiroshi Nishiura from um, he was at Hokkaido University at the time. Now he's at Kyoto, and he's one of these like superstars, you know, that was like Omi Sensei and whatever. And he had just come. He had had a team of researchers looking into Wuhan and looking into the data. And this is, again, at that time we thought, well, maybe it's just going to be a China problem. You know, maybe it's not going to be so bad. And Nishioda is in this room and he, and he, he goes through the data and he's like, he's a, sign, he's a mathematical epidemiologist. So he models these things. And he looked at the early, early China data and he, and he told this room of journalists, this has global pandemic potential. And there was just a chill in the room. Because we realized, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. Less than a month later, we went into lockdown, right? We went into a lockdown a month later. Wow. And so, you know, I guess, you know, does it scare me or am I, I mean, that was an interesting moment to realize, like, okay, it's serious. But then it's also that it, it was a mir you know, it was a miracle. It was amazing that vaccines and treatments were made so quickly and i am a real wuss when it comes to needles right i hate i would i've never gotten a flu shot because i would rather get the flu than get a flu shot <laughs> but i was convinced like i don't want this disease and as soon as i can get a vaccine i'm gonna get it mm -mm -mm -mm. and i did and then as soon as i can get a booster i got it and and then again also knowing that it's it's actually sometimes to your benefit to mix and match the vaccines again from kind of talking to the experts and talking reading the reports and stuff and again i'm not a scientific expert i'm not a doctor but i talk to them <laughs> i talk to a lot of them so the first vaccine i could get uh for a booster was moderna so it was pfizer pfizer moderna and a lot of people were like waiting until they could get like you know pfizer 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 you know <laughs> <laughs> I think Pfizer's stock is probably doing pretty good right now. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's an example where I was comfortable and I was informed about, you know, that it was that it was speed rather than brand that, that was important. Getting that booster as quickly as possible. And I got mine relatively quickly because I, I, I hustled. I found a clinic. And I could get it. Thanks, Twitter. Yeah. And so I... To my knowledge, I've never gotten COVID. Maybe I did and was asymptomatic. But, you know, you, know there, you can never eliminate the danger. You can just sort of mitigate. You can lessen your risk and mitigate the damage. And that's by wearing masks. You know, it's by... Like, like we're, we're sitting right now. Like, we're in the room together, but we're apart, you know. And so we could be closer together, but... You know, this is, I was just a, at an event on, on Monday uh, by Deacon the, at the in Kobe University. And they're, they're using these supercomputers. Well, one supercomputer known as Fugaku. And they said, like, they're mapping in real time, like, like well, they're, they're simulating the ejection of viral particles into the air when you speak, when you talk, when you sing. So they did all these, like, Examples of like, you know, imagine like a round table that might, it might be at a buffet and four people are talking to each other. So according to their supercomputer com computations, like uh, if these four people are talking to each other and one of them has Omicron and they talk to each other for 30 minutes, there's a 30% chance that one of these four people will, will get it, will be infected. But just by having like a partition, right, it, it breaks up the airflow and sends it like into the air, into the ceiling. And as long as you have pretty good circulation, ventilation, then that risk of transmission goes down to near zero. So those stupid partitions actually work. I mean, I don't know. It, you know, these, these are PhDs and they're using supercomputers. <laughs> It sounded a little too good to be true, but that's just an example. You can never really eliminate the danger, but you can, you can minimize it. And then again, that's sort of getting from a pandemic to an endemic situation. 
Whoa. I'm having a, a Tim and Eric like moment the right now. Yeah, the universe. <laughs> and even if you get it, now we have, uh, there's two pills that apparently uh, minimize, uh, there, there's, a, there's a Pfizer pill and there's a Merck pill that is oral treatment. So the, er, the early treatments were like IVs and you had to be in a hospital and they didn't work all that great. These antiviral pills seem to work pretty well. And there's a third one probably on the way made domestically by a company called Shionogi. So there's a lot of hope for that pill as well. So pretty soon we might have three options for people that if, if you get COVID and if you start to get sick, you take these pills early on, as early on as you can, and it stops you from getting a serious case. Wow. And it can hopefully keep you from going to the hospital. And so during, you know, every country experienced the pandemic differently. Japan has a very good medical system, but it's relatively weak when it comes to uh, emergency care and intensive care. And so it, there were these bottlenecks with serious cases where people could not get into the hospital and they died at home. We're not talking like a whole lot of people, but enough that it was, it was a tragedy. It was, it was a scandal. And that's partly what sunk Suga, right? So the idea is that you got to minimize, you know, try to keep that hospital bed use utilization rate at like, again, the Goldilocks number that people like to look at is like 50%. Because then you still have to have room for traffic accidents, you know, and heart attacks and, you know, diabetic shock, things like that. So you still have to have this, this leeway for like the, the everyday uh, health emergencies. So that's where we're going. It's funny you said that about Japan's hospitals, and obviously Japan is a economic superpower, and it has, of course, lots of hospitals across the country. But when we're talking about like beds per capita, do you think Japan is adequately equipped in its hospitals? Again, I just have to sort of cite the figures, right? Um, I remember looking at the OECD figures, which kind of compares con you know, ma the major economies. By, by that data, Japan had the most number of beds per capita of all of the OECD countries. And I, f I forget the exact numbers, but you could safely say there's enough beds. But then you come to this crisis and you realize that they didn't have the right kind of beds. They didn't have like the infection control beds. They didn't have as many as they needed. They didn't have as many ICU beds. So that was like, again, the choke point for the Japanese medical system. You know, it, and it's by and large a great system that's, that's uh, modern and most, mostly free for most people. But that was a, a choke point that really exposed some of those weaknesses. Yeah, it's really interesting in looking at how the pandemic has exposed cracks in, you know, huge economic superpowers. And you, I think pre-pandemic, a lot of us thought that, you know, if we're in Japan, if we're in the United States, if we're in France, if we're in the UK, we're going to be fine because we have all of this technology and infrastructure and that's going to protect us. But it kind of didn't. A lot of things, like for example, like almost every country or tried these like tracking apps, right? Japan's was called Coco. Cocoa, <laughs> yeah, I still got it. I mean that for fun, you know, didn't really work. You know, uh, you still uh, have to download it when you go to the airport, yeah, though. Yeah, I, at one point when I was at the Olympics, I had like four different tracking apps for you know that you you had to be forced to, to download and maintain every day. But Singapore tried it, uh, South Korea tried it, Europe tried it. It's a good idea, but it just it never is even when it worked, and it was trying to track your close contacts. Well, you know it depends on a critical number of people using it, and a lot of people didn't. And it depends on the app working, and a lot of times it didn't. <laughs> and then, even if you iron out all those bugs, then the virus changes. And then it's just that whole idea of tracking just wasn't meaningful anymore. You, you, know, you could say that Japan was at the forefront globally on a couple things. First, 
Japan was the first to really establish that this was a aerosol virus spread in the air. That's something that the CDC and many countries did not embrace until relatively late in the pandemic. But Japan, even without the actual scientific confirmation of it, they just used reasoning. They're like, this thing spreads at karaoke bars and, and, and the yakatabune and at choir practice. And especially when drinking is involved. And, yeah. And they developed the three C's. A lot of people make fun of this, but it, it's a good policy. You know, it's, it's, and it's about a risk of reduction policy. The other thing they did was the retroactive tracing. And that was that they figured early on that if five people are exposed, usually one person get it, gets it. And then that one person uh, will spread to like 14 people. So they, they developed retroactive tracing to find these nodes and, you know, it depended on the, uh, the health offices, the Hokenjo, to do that sort of detective work. And it worked until it didn't. You know, the virus changed, the infect in in infectability changed, and it became just too much work for that detective work. So, but it was a, it was a, a brilliant strategy that worked until it didn't. Well, you know, and I think, you know, we should give it credit because it really did stem off some of the worst parts of the pandemic in Japan. And we really never saw the levels of infection and death and destruction that we saw in other major countries. I think you'd have to say that. I mean, every country stumbled in some way, but Japan's total case count and total death count are relatively low. And then the critics might say, well, we don't know the true numbers because Japan doesn't test as much. And that's, that's a valid criticism perhaps, but for sure, Japan has never had a, a brutal lockdown like what was done in parts of the U S in Australia, New Zealand, in parts of Europe. I, I think there was only, only one month or two months where you, you couldn't go to the movies, right? You couldn't mm. go to the gym. So it's, it's a way that kept the domestic economy mostly alive and, and, and going and, and, and yet still was able to control these clusters so that it didn't overwhelm the medical system, but it came close a couple times. It did. It did. Well, you know, Japan has uh, easy access to ivermectin. Not going to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's an inside joke for those who know they know. And on that bombshell, Rocky, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was really educational, and I think we learned a lot of things about a lot of things. My pleasure. It's a, it's a pleasure to meet you, Aaron, and, and always talk to you, Parker. Yes, thank you so much, Rocky. Hey, listeners, that's right, you. You listen to right there. Who do you think should be our next guest on Tokyo Wave? Let us know. Drop us a line at wave at tokyowave.jp. We hope you enjoy Tokyo Wave. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Join us again next week on Tokyo Wave.